from MTN News. This is the debate for Montana's first congressional district. Now, here's tonight's moderator, Donna Kelly. And good evening and thank you for joining us. Welcome to Montana's Western District U.S. House debate hosted by the Montana Television Network. We will be with you for the next hour and we are commercial free. Let's meet our candidates now. Republican candidate Ryan Zinke is a fifth generation Montanan, a 23 year veteran of the U.S. Navy, a decorated U.S. Navy SEAL officer, and he served two terms in the Montana State Senate, was twice elected as Montana's congressman, and served two years as U.S. Secretary of the Interior, becoming the first Montanan to serve in the presidential cabinet in the state's history. He and his wife Lolita have three children. Democratic candidate Monica Trinnell was raised on a ranch in eastern Montana. She would become a world-class rower, competing in two Olympics, winning a world championship gold for the United States women's rowing team. After working her way through college and law school, Trinnell would later take on a monopoly utility. She lives in Missoula with her husband and three daughters. Libertarian candidate John Lamb is also running to represent District 1. Lamb did not meet the debate participation criteria set by Montana Television Network's editorial board. John Lamb told our panelist Jonathan Ambarian he understood the criteria. However, during the MTN 10 o'clock news tonight and on our website, we will have a piece featuring John Lamb. The format for tonight's debate will be a direct question to a candidate from one of our panelists. The candidate will have 60 seconds to answer, followed by a 30 second rebuttal from the second candidate, and then the first candidate will have a final 30 seconds to respond to the rebuttal. If a panelist feels the first candidate did not understand or answer the question, the panelist can ask a follow-up or clarifying question. The candidate will then have 30 seconds to clarify their initial response. At the conclusion of this debate, each candidate will have 90 seconds for a closing statement and a random drawing decided the order of tonight's questions and Mr. Ryan Zinke will receive the first question and will make the first closing statement. And for our panelists, I was born in Haver, raised in Bozeman. I worked in radio and television since 1973 and graduated from Bozeman Senior High. My award-winning coverage includes the Olympic Park bombing and I've been with MTN since 2007 with a short stint of retirement. Also joining us is Jill Valley, a revered anchor at MTN's Bureau in Missoula. Jill is an award-winning journalist who has covered Montana news for nearly three decades. And finally, Jonathan Ambarian. He is a senior political reporter with MTN based out of Helena. He has spent six years with the network covering government and elections in Montana. So let's take a deep breath, all of us and try to do the best that we can for this next hour for the voters because that's why we're here. And we thank you very much for, for joining us. As we said, Mr. Zinke, you get the first question and you're getting hammered on this, the federal investigations. Yeah. Did you lie to investigators? Did you benefit from a land deal? And if you didn't do anything wrong, why did you resign? Well, that's a good question. So I think everyone should realize what federal in investigations are. Anybody can file a complaint on a federal investigation, and that investigation by law has to be investigated, a complaint, and that's what makes a federal investigation. I went through 18 of them to include investigations on my socks, my dog, my car. Every investigation led to the same conclusion, no wrongdoing, no conflict of interest, no rules or laws were break. After five years and hundreds of thousands of dollars spent, the conclusion was Zinke did not follow the, the employer's manual and lacked candor. This is interesting about candor. How do you lack candor when you weren't interviewed? And oh, by the way, the same person that said lack of candor was a, was a political hack that also approved Hunter Biden's travel on Air Force Two. I'm a former SEAL officer. I don't lie, but neither am I going to be intimidated or bullied by biased investigators from the very department that I was trying to change. Okay, Ms. Trinnell. Thank you, Donna. Thank you, MTN. And thank you, John Lamb, for appearing with me in debates across the district. I guess we were at the Olympics together in 1996. So 
Thank you so much for everything you're doing here tonight. <clears throat> With respect to uh, Ryan's investigations, read the February report from 2022 and the August report from 2022. You can find links to them on our website. Google Ryan Zinke corruption and they're right there. Those investigations say themselves that he lied to criminal investigators. And the fact that he says he wasn't interviewed, that's a lie right there. So I guess you're like Alice in Wonderland. You'd never have a day without saying at least three lies before 10 a.m. You no, know, Monica, lies seem to come from your mouth because I was not not interviewed on the Whitefish Project, which, by the way, really quickly, was a free children's sledding park that my family runs. I have no financial interest in any other. And that investigation, I wasn't interviewed. Yet the report said lacked candor. Lacked candor, not lies. The investigation never says lie. It says lacked, lacked candor because I violated or I did not follow the employee manual. Let's be clear. I'm a SEAL. I don't lie, but I'm not going to be intimidated or bullied by biased investigators from the same department I was trying to change. Read, read the reports yourself. All Jill. right. Thank you. My next question goes to Ms. Trinnell. The Zinke campaign is criticizing you for representing a man convicted of child rape. Can you clarify what is that all about and how will you fight crime if elected? So uh, Ryan has been investigated and the reports conclude that he has lied under oath and he was interviewed and he lied about what was happening there. Um, my representation you can find on the Montana Supreme Court's website. Um, go to their opinion page and put my name in and you can read the opinion yourself. Everything is right there. Under the sixth and seventh amendments of our constitution, we are granted affirmative rights to a jury trial. And that has been interpreted to mean effective assistance of counsel. So the claims that we brought were that the underlying trial had not been fair. And it had nothing to do with the underlying charges. It had to do with the trial itself. We claimed it wasn't fair. There was no set of circumstances where the person in question would have been released to roam the neighborhood streets free. Ryan's ad is dishonest. It's a lie. We've asked Sinclair to take it down because he's lying in his ad about me. And you can read those charges himself. Everybody in America is entitled to due process, even Ryan Zinke. Well, Monica, that's not quite true. And I agree that everyone deserves a fair representation. But in Montana, we throw child rapists that are guilty, convicted, and it was on appeal, convicted of raping four small children. We throw them in jail. We don't elect lawyers who defend them and want to release them. Secondly, you say you're pro-police, but yet you're the legal counsel for 350 Montana, which advocates to defund the police. And I although they actually, deny it, excuse um, me, although they deny it, well, you can't say up, divesting so. police budget is anything less than defunding. So Thank are you. we going to have uh, more than more time? I would like us equal yes. time here. We so. will. We're we'll watching time. Um, we have four people watching clocks. Yeah. At so the, uh, so the, the uh, ad that Ryan Zinke has says that I have uh, worked to let a child rapist roam our neighborhood streets. So that is a flat out lie. And the first person that Ryan called when he was being investigated for lies and for being um, investigated for his, uh, you know, lying on, uh, while he was at the interior was his lawyer. We're all entitled to due process under the law. That is the American way. That is what we do. I absolutely support funding for law enforcement. I've done ride-alongs across this district. And Ryan Zinke actually voted against funding for law enforcement. Look at our records. Look at what we've actually done, who we've actually worked for, and the work that we've done. Okay. Jonathan. Uh, Mr. Zinke, uh, we'll turn now to the issue of inflation. It's an issue, cost of living, inflation issues that are on a lot of minds of many people in Montana. Have you personally been affected by the inflation issue? And what do you think needs to be done at the federal level to get Montana families to help them make ends meet? Well, I think all Montanans have been affected by inflation. Inflation really is the factor of two things that are main drivers. One is energy costs, which Monica wants to destroy American oil and gas industry. And when energy costs are low, that helps drive inflation down. The other factor is spending, of which Monica, on the record, wants $133 trillion, that's with a T, new spending. 
So Monica wants to kill American oil and gas industry to bring gas back down where it should be, about two bucks a gallon when I was secretary. And she wants to then spend and, and drive inflation up. And if you drive inflation up, interest rates come down. But the number one fa issue facing Montanans today is inflation, which again is energy costs, get them down, and spending. If we do those two things, then inflation will come back down and maybe a 5% raise will mean something right now. Today, a 5% raise, it doesn't mean anything. You're still 10 points behind on inflation. Ms. Trinnell, your rebuttal. Thank you. I've spent the last 15 months and I've put 40,000 miles on my minivan traveling this district. I know Montana and I live in Montana. I'm raising my kids here. I work here. And what I've heard across the district is Montanans are hurting and the issue is housing, 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 housing. Of all of the, candidates, the three candidates in this race, I'm the only one with a plan to actually address inflation and, um, and the affordability crisis. Look at my website, monicatrinnell.com. My plan tackles inflation and the affordability crisis by saying, let's build things here. Let's invest in Montana, which I will do because I live here. And also, let's take on corporate monopolies and tackle the monopolization of profits for private people. I've spent 25 years keeping money in your pocket because I've been here. I know how to do this. I've been doing it, and I'll continue to do it for Montana. Uh, Mr. Zinke, a final word on this issue. Well, all right, $133 trillion in new spending. She wants more taxes, not only on corporations, but every family that makes $200,000 or less in Montana, and, of course, supporting the IRS agents, 87,000 of them. And, Monica, the Inflation Reduction Act, your comment is awesome. So it's more spending, more taxes, and picking on American energy to drive energy costs up. You can't have affordable housing when inflation is running above 10%, which it is because of the policies of the Biden administration, which you support. So Ms. Trinnell, let's stick with inflation here for just a moment. You supported the Inflation Reduction Act. Both of you have done very well in life. You're very successful. Can you relate to the average Montanan who's living paycheck to paycheck and getting a bite taken out of it with inflation and like a senior citizen who's living on fixed income? Uh, look, I do want to say that uh, Ryan's only strategy in this race has been to talk about national policies and to falsely link me to national things because he doesn't live in Montana. I know Montana. I live in Montana. This is my home. It's my only home, unlike Ryan. And because you can't talk about Montana because you don't live here, I can. And I know Montana. So I know, Donna, how this is actually impacting Montanas because I've been talking to them. I've traveled this district. I've spent tens of thousands of miles and hours talking with people. I've been here in Montana. I've been a single mom here. I had a food budget of $70 a week. And I know what it means when you have to budget your groceries, when you have to pay for gas. And every time you put gas in your tank, you think about how much of that money is going into Ryan Zinke's pocket. He took $460,000 from ConocoPhillips last year alone. Montana is hurting right now, and we can't afford to have purchased politicians like Ryan Zinke representing us. We need a Montanan representing us, and that's me. You know, Mon Monica, the snake commercial, for instance, is, is interesting to me because that snake's not native to Montana, but get, then again, either are you. I was born in Montana. I live in Montana. Matter of fact, I live in the same house our family's been living for four generations. So don't tell me I'm not from Montana. You know what? I've gone around Montana, too. You know, the things that are hurting are inflation, energy costs too much, fertilizers too much. And I don't, I don't participate in false, you know, little, little, tricks that you pull on, on, on this driving around, looking at, at polls and, and, and whatever you do. I talk to real Montanans, like businesses, and that's why I'm endorsed by small businesses, because I understand it. That's why I understand the issues about Montana, because I am from Montana. Ms. Trinnell, I, would like I to assume you're saying that because she was born in Wyoming. And so, you know. I, I, I say Powder River, let her buck, and there are a lot of rattlesnakes out there, and I know how to deal with a snake, Ryan. Uh, as far as inflation in Montanans, which I think the question is about, and people who are hurting and how we'll help you, I've been here. I've been with you. I've been by your side. I've been working for you. I've kept $10 million in your pockets because I was there. I stood up to Northwestern when they wanted to raise your rates, and that was an all-Republican commission. For the last 10 years, your rates have doubled, and I was there, and you pay less because of me. 
I've been there for you. I will be there for you in Congress. Thank you. All right, thank you. This next question is to Mr. Zinke. You supported the Keystone XL pipeline. Can you explain why and do you feel that that would just encourage a different form of dirty energy with no real benefit for the energy consumers here in Montana? Well, this is a good question because Monica opposed it. I strongly support it because made in American energy, and it's all of the above, but you can't dispute the fact that American energy made here is better under our regulation than, and cleaner than produced overseas. The Keystone is a critical part of infrastructure. We need hydrocarbons to make sure that the grid is stable. Monica's right. She did sue Northwestern Energy, and we're going to pay for it in everyone's rates. Because when the wind doesn't blow and the sun doesn't shine, you still need energy. And that energy makeup should come from hydrocarbons. Again, if you're concerned about the environment, we do it better. When I was a secretary, we went from 8.3 to 12.5. We were the world's largest exporter of energy. But we did it by lowering emissions, and we had the best safety record uh, in the history of this country. So hydrocarbons is an important component of energy. It's also a important part of our, our economy and national security. Uh, so I would actually just like to point out, Ryan, that I'm pretty good about speaking for myself and I don't need you to put words in my mouth and when you're citing me, I would like you to cite the sources because everything you've said is completely unsourced and nothing that ever came out of my mouth. So um, with respect to the energy transition, it's happening, it's here, and I am positioned to make it work for Montana in a way that's super exciting. Uh, Beaverhead County, one of the counties in this district, has a tax base of a billion dollars. They have a solar project going in there that's a $500 million additional tax to that county. That's real money, and this is coming to our rural counties across Montana. We can make this work, and we can make it work for Montana, and I'm positioned to lead, and I will. Thank you. Well, if you want to spend $10 on gasoline, I'd say vote for Monica. But the bottom line is energy drives an economy. When energy costs are down, when I was secretary, there were about $2 a gallon, where they should be. And energy is a component of an economy. And when you have high energy costs and you have high spending, guess what happens? You have high inflation rate. And look, I, you know, I'm not hydrocarbon centric. I'm all the above. But hydrocarbons, when you're going to kill it, you kill Montana's economy and its national security. So, Ms. Trinell, I'd like to stay on this issue of energy for a moment. You talked about the energy transition, the new energy economy you've talked about. Do you think that the country is really in a position to make a full-scale shift to alternative energy sources in a, in a reasonable amount of time? As we are talking here tonight, uh, millions are out of power on the East Coast. And Governor DeSantis is now begging for federal dollars when he denied them to New York City. Um, there is an extreme drought in Montana. It's, we're going into our third year of drought. Um, it, people are hurting. It was almost 100 degrees in, in Billings last week. So we need to address this issue. And this is a math problem. It's an engineering problem. This is an incredibly exciting moment. And I believe in America. I believe in Montana. And we're, we're the country that sent somebody to the moon. We know how to do this. This is a, this is a moment of opportunity. And if we're going to talk about the new energy economy, let's talk about the billion dollar green hydrogen project at the industrial part park in Butte. Let's talk about the flow battery project in Columbia Falls. Let's talk about opening our lumber mills to be able to um, use the forest management that we need to have happen. Let's talk about the wind and the hybrid battery and energy project. Let's talk about the wind project that has completely replaced coal strip units one and two, bringing $217 million to five counties. Yes, we are positioned to do this. Yes, we can do it. Yes, it will be good for Montana, and I will help lead that. Uh, Mr. Zinke? Any serious person that thinks about energy uh, realizes we can't run this state on wind power and pixie dust and hope and hydrogen, which is 400 times more expensive. Look, I'm all the above, but every component has its consequences. Wind takes about 750,000 birds, uh, kills a year, plus bats. Hydro has its, has its own issues, and, and so does hydrocarbons. But you cannot, you cannot dispute the three things. It is better to produce energy in this country under our regulation than to watch it get produced overseas. Because when the United States doesn't lead on energy, someone else does. Russia is 41% dirtier. And if you want to look at how not to produce energy, I'll take you on a tour of Saudi and Africa. Okay.
Mr. Nelson. True energy independence means that we will be able to have energy here and we won't be held hostage by these terrible dictators abroad. The fossil fuel that you are dependent on that's funding your campaign that gave you $460,000 last year alone, no wonder you're a fan of it. But look, this is a time of change and hope and energy, true energy independence allows us to cook our food, heat our home, run our machines when the grid goes down. So let's modernize the grid. Let's embrace this moment. Let's embrace this moment and make it work for Montana. We can do this. And I, I know we can, because I know Montana. Mr. Zenke, COVID-19, such a terrible couple of years that we're coming out of for the country and for the world. Uh, if we get an uptick this winter of COVID-19 again, what would you be in favor of uh, in regards to masks, uh, vaccinations, closing schools, what would you recommend to go up against an, another uptick if we get it for COVID-19? Well, I'm actually opposed to forced vaccinations. And look, if you didn't march in line like a little communist and you even dared to raise your hand about the efficacy of the recent jab, about natural immunity, then you were shunned, you were shamed, you were deplatformed. If you were a nurse, you could lose your license. If you were a Navy SEAL, you could actually be discharged for service. So vaccinations first is a personal choice. I got a vaccination, I encourage others, but it's a personal choice. Uh, you follow the science, do mass help. In some cases they do, in some cases they don't. Our children in school, they're already behind two years or more, as well as the socialization skills. So if we have another pandemic, or it's gonna be a flu or whatever, one, vaccinations are personal choice and not mandated. And we have to look at the consequences of also of masks and making sure that we violate, we don't violate First Amendment rights, Second Amendment rights, Third Amendment rights on, on, on our Constitution. Ms. Trinnell? <laughs> Thank you. I think the question was about COVID-19 uh, vaccines. And, and, and masks and schools closing, and, and if we get an uptick, what would you support? Yes, yeah, so how would we handle any kind of increase if there is? So I think that COVID-19 uh, has now become endemic, and so it's no, we're out of the pandemic, and it's now endemic, and so we're, we're actually treating it right now. I would like to note that as we are he here tonight, um, more people are dying from COVID every week than died in 9-11. So it's still an ongoing issue and we need to address it. What we did with creating the vaccines was amazing, but I wanna give a real shout out to our healthcare workers and our teachers. What an incredible job you all did during really challenging times. And as we're coming back together in our communities and celebrating together, I know my sister's a teacher and she said, it's so great to be able to see everybody's faces again. So this is a good moment that we're coming back to Mr. now. Mr. Zinke, 30 seconds. Well, on vaccinations, I think we have to be diligent, of course, and, and follow the science. But when the science is cooked up, it has effects on everybody. So I do think that vaccinations, if appropriate, but it's a personal choice again. It shouldn't be mandated. And there's a consequence of not gathering. There's a consequence in our schools of not socializing. There's a consequence of having masks. And those consequences have to be weighed. Mandated, I don't agree with. And, and I didn't get, Ms. Trinnell, if you would mandate a vaccine or if you felt so strongly about masks and mandates for those and, and closing schools. I'm, I'm really glad to hear Ryan say that he believes so strongly in personal choice and I hope that you apply that rationale to whether or not a woman should have a baby or a family should have uh, decide to be parents. And we're headed um, there next, actually, but how about the question on, the, on COVID? So, I, I mean, I don't mandates. think it's, it's a non-issue. I mean, I think we're out of that phase, and we're now at a time where this is endemic, and we have a public health. Um, we've, we've met that moment. We've had the vaccines. We have the boosters, um, and we've moved on as a country. Jill? Okay, so we are now gonna talk a couple of questions now about abortion. So my first question is to you, Ms. Trinnell, is there any point where you would not support abortion rights and what would that be, if anything? Uh, the decision about whether or not you become a parent, it's about privacy and freedom. And this is a really, really significant issue that will be on the ballot and one of the three of us, John Lamb, Ryan Zinke, or myself, will vote on this issue up or down. And so you need to know where we stand. I stand with you with privacy and with freedom. Right now, 
10 state attor attorney generals have issued 50,000 subpoenas to Google for location data based on word searches that you're putting in. This is a kind of world that Ryan Zinke wants us to live in. He supports no exceptions even to save a woman's life. That's a platform of the Montana Republican Party, which he has not disavowed. And it's his right to life letter on his website, which he has not disavowed. I support your right to choose how, when, and whether you become a parent. One of the most fundamental, most important decisions you will ever make in your life. It's your private decision to make. And you make it, and you have the freedom to make it in America. And I will always stand with you with privacy and freedom. And if they can, if they can come after you for searching about abortion, they can come after you for searching about guns, for hunting, and even about what book you want to read. Oh, Mr. Zinke? I would say nice try, Monica. Once again, you lie about my position, and you lie to women about it. This is my position, and make sure there's no doubt, is that I am pro-life, but I also understand dire circumstances. So I am opposed to an outright ban because it does not take in consideration the very difficult decisions. But Monica, this is not about privacy. It's about abortion. And your position to, to accept an abortion moments before birth and hide under prime or privacy is barbaric. You would not take What's a, barbaric excuse is, me, excuse your time me. is up, your time is up. What's barbaric is for you to take this moment of incredible heartbreak at the end of a pregnancy. Parents who choose that do in very extreme, heartbreaking circumstances. For you to use that as a political pawn to justify taking away our privacy and our freedom to make choices about when we become a, a parent, that's barbaric. And look, you're going to have to vote up or down with Mitch McConnell. No exceptions. That's where your party is. You have never disavowed it. And you can't dance on the head of that pin and say, well, I don't like it. You, you are going to vote Monica, on it. I'm going to vote on it. And I'm going to vote for you, Monica, Montana, your time is to make up. your I have 30 own seconds. personal yeah, They also ask you, you talk about dire circumstances. Could it be specific? What are you talking yeah, about there? Let's th finish this point. No, I mean, are because, we on a new? You don't set the rules for the debate, excuse Ryan. Me. Excuse you me, don't. Monica, your time No, is I want the panelists. That was a question. It's complete. If we're starting a new one, we'll start a new one. But to clarify, Monica, are it's we, not what only is third, the question third semester, here? but the moments to birth, that is barbaric. Period. Are we still okay. are we still no, going on this? No, I'm, I'm asking you about yes. the dire. What dire circumstances are you talking? Rape, incest. Is this a new question? I'm, I'm talking. Uh, just a follow up, and then we'll have another one. Do I get yeah. a rebut that? Yes. Thank so you. So the dire circumstances are many, and it's difficult to legislate all of them because you can't imagine what those circumstances are. I'm a father, and I'm also a husband, and I understand their circumstances. There's rape. There's there's incest. There's dire circumstances that are not conceived or could be legislated. So I understand that. And I have my record on it is very, very clear. But also, I stand absolutely opposed to the idea that you can hide behind privacy and take a child's life moment before birth. That is not Montana, and that is barbaric. Nobody in Montana supports that, Ryan. And if you are talking about allowing exceptions, you are absolutely going against the position of your party. And I would like all of the voters in Montana to know that John Lamb has a position on this. And you should give him a look. He is actually a man of integrity and of principle. I've come to know him as that. My position is that this is about freedom and privacy. Your private decision to decide how you become a family, how you become a parent. You have the freedom to decide that in America, and this is about your freedom, your privacy. I will stand by that always. Thank you. Mrs. Zinke, just one further follow-up regarding abortion. I wanted to ask you, the Dobbs decision from the Supreme Court sent the issue of abortion back to the states, and in Montana, it remains legal right now. Do you favor any action from the federal government that would restrict what's currently allowed within this state? I think it's too soon, but I also think we should also realize, too, that any bill that restricts should also be accompanied with access to birth control. And yes, I have voted against Planned Parenthood because it's the same, same Planned Parenthood that says a man can get pregnant and also profits from body parts of children. So I, I would say I am against uh, Planned Parenthood about taxpayer funding. 
But to your question is, this is a tough issue, and there are limits. And when it's un unlimited, to the moments before birth, if you're Catholic, it's murder. It's barbaric, in my opinion, and it's unacceptable in Montana. Mr. No. Uh, the Dobbs decision didn't send the decision back to the state. The so language in the Dobbs decision says it's returning it to our elected officials. Lindsey Graham introduced a bill that the national party will vote on banning abortions, and Steve Daines has signed on to that bill. So that's where we are right now. The Republican Party has proposed a national ban on all abortions. And it, look, if this is an issue about reducing unwanted pregnancies, we know how to do that. We know how to make contraception available. Ryan Zinke and his party have done nothing to make contraception available. In fact, he's voted against it. He's voted against women's health care. He's voted against universal pre-K. He's voted against anything that helps our families have the children they want to have. Mr. Zinke. That is patently untrue, as you know, but you're used to that, evidently. And a man of integrity, you know, it's difficult to, to run, a, you know, to have an election and have your family and, and your kids, you know, listen to the lies about you. But this is not about just this issue. This is about where we're going as a country. And, and do we have morals as a country? Do we have moral standing? Are we going right, to make the right decisions about our family, about our nation, about our future? Ms. Trinnell, you mentioned this before about affordable housing, and in many places in Montana, including Gallatin County, the prices of houses are absolutely sky high, and now the interest rates are up and cutting out more people to be able to afford a house. What can you do, what would you support to make people or to help people get a house and be able to afford it? And also there's some concern about some stock that you own in Airbnb, and you were trashing that company while talking and saying that they were part of the problem on affordable housing. Thank you, Don, for the question. So as, I've, as I have traveled this dr district on the trail, I have heard the three top issues we're facing are housing, housing, and housing. And that looks different in every community across this district. So in Troy, there are real physical constraints on how you build. Butte used to be a city of 100,000 uh, people. Now it's 30,000. Density is a different option there. Here in Gallatin County, you have precious farmland, so you need to make decisions about how you use the land here. So some of the federal answers to this problem include um, ending speculative corporate ownership. So there aren't houses that are sitting empty. There are enough second homes in Gallatin County to house all of the people who don't have homes right now. Um, and so we need to end that. And to your question about uh, my personal assets, I've committed to putting them into a blind trust, which I will do. Um, and Ryan Zinke has made $30 million during his time, not only as a lobbyist at the Interior and in Congress. Um, but the housing issue, my affordability plan addresses it as well, and that's on my website at monicatrinnell.com. Go ahead, Mr. Zinke. Well, you know, I wish I made 5% of what she says against the lie. But affordable housing is this. You've got to bring the cost of energy down. You have to bring spending down. If you do that, you bring inflation down. If you bring inflation down, then you bring interest rates down. That's the first step. And then you have to make the cost per unit down so people can actually afford it. Because housing is not only important for short term, but also long term wealth. How do you bring housing down? We should look at a 50 year mortgage. You should look at the government putting capital in to incentivize multifamily units. We should look at Fannie Mae, Fannie Mac, perhaps opening up the, the, the throttles so condos would be easier to buy. The, your first house might not be a $800,000 three-bedroom, two-bathroom house in Bozeman, Montana, but it can be the, some of the alternatives. You, what you want to do is get in the market so long term you develop wealth and you can actually own a house in your lifetime and, and raise a family. And Thank you. Trail. So some of the answers that the feds can do for housing is to make sure that the resources that are available are absolutely get, actually getting delivered into the communities that need them. And so some of that looks like making sure that tax credits are, are available. And so for every four projects in Montana that are able to get built right now, only one is actually getting funded and getting tax credit. So we can change that and we can make that look a little bit better. We can make more starter homes available. And we also need to look at renters too because that's an, that's an issue as well. And so we need to make sure that there's enough supply 
across a district, but we also need to make sure that we're incentivizing development and building. And we, we have a lot of good projects going. I mean, in Missoula, in Bozeman, across this district, there is a lot of construction going on. So part of the answer make, make, is making sure that our labor, our workforce, is actually able to have a place to live so that they can continue to do the work that's needed on this. All right, thank you. My next question is to Mr. Zinke. China-based companies are buying American land, for example, 300 acres in North Dakota, which is actually located near a military base. I believe they want to build a milling plant. Now, some say that's great. Others do feel, though, that this is a threat to national security and could uh, cause some problems in our food supply. What is your position on that? I absolutely agree that we got to prevent China you know, from buying our, our farmland. But we also have to prevent other units too, other organizations like the American Prairie Reserve that funds Monica that takes productive land out of service forever. And it affects our smaller communities in Montana because when you don't have productive land, that means you're not going to sell fertilizer, you're not going to raise cattle, you're not going to make those land productive, and you're going to take it out of the food chain forever. Food is a, is a national security issue. Certainly it is in Montana. It's still the number one ag is. But when you take that productive land out in projects that are funded by mostly by Europe and outside forces, American Prairie Reserve is not being funded by Made in Montana, I can tell you. But that's also a threat. I think the question actually had to do with China buying um, land in America. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. I, okay. Uh, so to the question that was asked, I would say there are national processes in place that ensure that any transaction that is a national security threat can be stopped. Um, we do need to take China seriously as a threat. And my plan, my affordability plan, has a way to do that. So we build things here in America. We ensure that we have the independence to stop uh, the dependence on uh, microchips that is a real security threat. And we need to look at that and we need to plan for that. And I have a plan to do that. Um, the third thing that I would say really quickly is that we want to make sure that China isn't buying our politicians. Ryan Zinke's for sale. William Clark said the only men that he bought were men who were for sale. And Ryan Zinke sold himself to oil and gas. We want to make sure he doesn't sell himself to China. We don't want purchased politicians in Congress. Mr. Zinke. Uh, the question was about foreign influence in our farmland, which I correctly answered. And if you want to talk about China, the, the Inflation Reduction Act should have been named the Chinese Stimulus Act. Because where are all these components that are being made, they're going to be purchased? Well, guess what? China. So you look at American independence, we are becoming more dependent on China for critical minerals. A SEAL, for instance, in, in combat requires over two dozen. Where are they made? Where are they processed? China. So we, the only way to produce things here is to make sure we have energy low cost so we can produce here and not be dependent on China for solar cells, chips, and everything else. And I actually have a plan to get that done. Ms. Trinnell, uh, you've talked a lot about putting people above party. Tonight you said that you're concerned about being tied directly to nationalized policies. I was curious if you could point to anywhere where you disagree with the National Democratic Party. So I think that the question, Jonathan, really was about um, what you stated my position as, is it's actually Ryan Zinke's strategy to tie me to the National Party. That's what he has been doing. It's what his ads have my face morphing with Joe Biden. Um, and so uh, you know that's the only strategy he can have because he doesn't live in Montana. I do. I'm from here. My only home is here. Um, this is what I will serve. I will serve Montana. I know Montana. So I've been focused completely on this district, on serving this district. I'm, I'm focused on the issues that are facing Western Montana. I believe deeply in representative democracy, and I will represent this state and this district in a way that serves our interest. And so, I, you know, I think what's really important, I believe in funding the police. We need to f I've done ride-alongs with law enforcement across this district. I'm 100% with you and for you. We should not have law enforcement uh, addressing homeless issues, addic ad addiction issues. Um, these are things that we need to fund, and I am, I am totally behind and for. Mr. Zinke? I don't know how that's an answer to where you're going to buck your party, but you're pro-spending, pro-tax, you're lockstep with Nancy Pelosi's agenda, so you are. Where have I bucked it? Public lands. I am not a believer for selling or transferring public lands. 
Some Republicans are. I am not, and I've always had position. Now, I believe in managing them, because I think it's an, a disaster what's been going on in our public lands. And uh, an abortion, I'm pro-life. And I wish life was perfect, and I wish there was never a reason for a young woman to have an abortion or have that difficult decision. But I am not for banning, and that, and that for some Republicans, that's a hard pill to swallow. But that's where um, Montana is in my, in my heart. I want to make sure there's no abortions because we want to make sure we prevent with birth right. control and right. resources. All and right. it wouldn't Thank be nice you, if, if life was perfect. Mr. Nell, could you? Uh, well, Ryan, while you were actually in Congress voting and serving with Nancy Pelosi, I was on the ground here in Montana litigating on behalf of Montanans and winning for you. I went up against Northwestern Energy and kept $10 million in your pockets while you were in Congress voting and serving with Nancy Pelosi. So let's make sure we get that straight. On public lands, you actually voted to reduce Bears Ears National Monument, monuments in, in uh, Oregon, and other public lands across the country. That's your record. And everyone here, look it up for yourself. Go Google Ryan Zinke Public Lands. You'll see it. It's out there. And we have links to it on our website as well, monicatrinnell.com. Let's go to the Capitol riots of January 6th, Mr. Zinke, to you first. Um, how much responsibility do you think former President Trump should bear for those? And also, we have some Montanans who were there, they were arrested, and some of them have made plea agreements, and they are being fined and sent to jail, and do you support that punishment? Well, two things. Uh, January 6th was a blight on America. It was criminal. It was shameful. It was conduct unbecoming. It was destruction of government property, and yes, words have meaning. But was it an insurrection? No. And I have some personal experience dealing with insurrections and coups because I have fought overseas when those were going on. And what really is disturbing is either you charge and prosecute or you release. There are a number of cases where individuals were arrested and they have not been charged and they have not been released. We have not, there's no due process. The last time this has occurred, I think, in, in, the, in the presidency of Abraham Lincoln. <coughs> so, yes, was it embarrassing? Yes. Was it destructive? Yes. Was it criminal? Yes, yes, yes. It's a, sh it's a shameful event. No, it was an insurrection. I don't believe you can take an insurrection seriously when the head element is blue and wearing Viking horns. Ms. Trinnell. Yes, it was an insurrection, and I think it's really disingenuous to say that due process um, shouldn't be afforded to people, regular Montanans, who want to have their constitutional rights and to assert them and to say, well, those people, they, they were nice guys and they were just weren't wearing fake things. People died. Law enforcement died. They had to hang Mike Pence. And this was a dangerous moment in our history. It was the only time in our history that a foreign flag was flown in our capital. That is not American. That's not the American way, and uh, it was wrong. Mr. Zinke. Again, I think it was shameful. I think it was conduct of becoming. I think it was criminal, but it was not an insurrection. And based on my experience, personal experience of civil wars and insurrections, it was not. But due process is afforded the, the people that have been arrested. They were thrown in, in prison. And they, you either charge them or you release them. That's America. I would like documentation and sites of your references to things that you've done. I can tell you, I, on July 28th, the day after the Olympic bombing, the centennial bombing, I, I was rowing in the Olympics. So it should be very easy for you to come up with sites to where you were when you're talking about these things. All right, my next question is to Ms. Trinnell. New polls indicate many Americans are really concerned about the integrity of our elections process right now. We have the ongoing claims of fraud that, again, have yet to be proven. What would you do to guarantee that our elections are not compromised? Um, so first of all, I think we need to be talking about it as leaders, that our elections are secure and fair, and it's nonsense to say anything different. The Republican Party flat platform that Ryan Zinke embraces says the elections in Montana were stolen. I would like to know which Republican, because it was a Republican sweep in 2020, which Republican didn't take office if they were all stolen. And I have been talking through this district on the trail to elected county officials. 
who are getting death threats in rural areas. These are women, they're all women. They've been in those offices for decades and they're getting death threats because of the nonsense. It's dangerous to be saying those things. And Ryan Zinke, in the primary, when it looked like he wasn't going to win, sent out a fundraising email accusing the Democrats of having stolen the Republican Party primary because he didn't think he was going to win. That's what's nonsense. That's dangerous. Our elections are secure, they're fair, and I encourage everyone to vote and get registered on our website, monicatrunell.com. Mr. Zinke. Elections. Elections should be fair and Montanans should have confidence that the elections are. And I too have talked around. I think Montana does a, does a good job with elections. I think the legislature put in proper provisions to make sure there were sideboards on it to improve the, uh, the election process and, and improve the confidence which the Montana Supreme Court rejected. I fundamentally disagree with a federal overview and a, fed, a federal takeover of our elections. I don't trust the federal government. I don't think they should be in, be in our elections. And the Constitution says so as, as well. That's all really great to hear. And so when I win this election, I will look forward to your concession call. The biggest form of voter suppression is apathy. And for anybody to be trotting out things that are saying um, anything about our election process, that, that makes it hard for people to believe in the system, and that's wrong. At heart, we are a nation that buys into our institutions, and our elections are one of the most important ones. Everyone in Montana needs to vote this election, and I really encourage our young people to vote. Your voice matters. Democracy works, and it works for you, but you need to participate. So please register and please vote. Just a little time check here. Ten minutes to your closing statements. Jonathan. Mr. Zinke, uh, you've said if elected, you want to propose a bill to make it easier to fire federal workers and to, I believe, cap the length of time that people can spend in federal jobs. Do you have any concern that that might further damage, perhaps, people's, or might it, might it further politicize the federal government? Well, from my experience, I didn't realize how deep the swamp was. I knew it was a swamp, and I waded in with hip boots. I should have had a boat. And so when you have federal employees that you can't fire, you can't move, you can't question, or you have weaponized investigators that are biased that can run amok, in my case, 18 investigations on my socks, my dog, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And they all lead to no, no conflict of interest, no breaking of rules and laws. We have a problem. It's like a, a, a college professor on steroids. So yeah, we need to hold them accountable. We also need to make sure the power, you know, the states should have a say. Uh, when a federal government makes a rule and ignores the plight of, of the state, that's a problem. When I was secretary, the sage grouse. I shifted it to the states where I thought it was better. I shifted a lot of decisions for the state where I thought it was better. How do you think you can manage the Yellowstone River if you don't know where it is? And the federal government wants to, wants to overreach and manage every part of our life. And most of that comes from the career bureaucrats that are entrenched and have been there that you can't move or can't fire. Everybody needs to be accountable to somebody. Thank you, Ms. Trinnell. Um, thank you, Jonathan. Let's be clear that the investigators uh, were appointed by President Trump who came and talked to you, Ryan, and found in February and August that you lied about the, um, to these investigators about what had happened. And if you do a word search of either of those reports, you don't find socks anywhere. These are serious allegations and serious conduct of ethics vi uh, violations. But talking about our federal government as the swamp is absolutely irresponsible. Our federal government has put somebody on the moon. We came up with a vaccine that saved millions of lives in a year. And I think we need to talk about public service, our teachers, our law enforcement, people who do forest management. This, it's, a, it's a calling, it's a public right. service, and we need to talk about it, it with Thank honor and with dignity. Thank you. Mr. Zinkier. Well, I'll ask the audience this. Is there any federal branch, division, agency of the federal government that you have full confidence and trust in? Likely the answer is no. When I grew up, it was a lot different. When the FBI said something, you could take it to the bank. Now when the FBI investigates and is a part of the Russian hoax, when the FBI puts their finger on elections by 
making sure they make a phone call to Zuckerberg and have him suppress the Hunter Biden laptop or sends the Junta squad down to Mar-a-Lago, people don't have confidence anymore in the FBI for a reason. And that's part of the federal government. So we need to bring transparency and accountability back to our federal employees and our federal government, particularly in Washington, D.C. Equal time, I will just point out that we can change our confidence in federal government by electing me. I will serve you, I will serve you well, and I will serve you with integrity and in sending Ryan Zinke back to Santa Barbara. He has Ms. no place in Montana. Ms. Trinnell, let's, let's move to the southern border here. Um, do you support what the Biden administration is doing at the southern border? Is it enough? And Lewis and Clark County Sheriff Leo Dutton just made a trip there and was quite alarmed from a report that I read about bringing drugs back to schools and the human trafficking. And in his words, he said, when you see it, it will rip your heart out. Are we doing enough? Uh, I, so thank you for the question about the southern border. And I think the question really about immigration, if that's what you're talking about, or fentanyl, those two issues often get lumped together. Um, I have done ride-alongs with law enforcement and asked them, what are you seeing in the streets with respect to fentanyl, if that's what you're talking about? Um, that, to the extent that's the issue, that's being mailed here from China, and the cartels in Mexico, some of the precursors are, are sending it to Mexico, and the cartels are shipping it in. We do need to get a handle on that problem, and it's a significant one, and we need to do more. So I absolutely support law enforcement. and. I also support a clear legal process so that people who want to come to America have a way to do that. At the Flathead Community College in Kalispell, I met two Ukrainians, Sergei and Natalia, who have immigrated here because they had to. So there is a legal process and that when that is followed, it matters, it makes a difference and people have a, an avenue to come here and we need to make sure that that avenue works. Mr. Zinke. Right now we have no southern border. Um, and when you don't have a border, you can't have a nation. And fentanyl is just one of the many things, and if you read the Wall Street Journal, which I do, is that the number one producer of fentanyl is no longer China, it is Mexico. And the, the drug cartels, according to A.G. Knudsen, are coming up right up to Montana. But it's not only fentanyl. It's child trafficking, sex trafficking, illegal activity across the board, and most of it, if not all of it, is coming straight up from, from Mexico. So we need to secure our border, and we can if we support law enforcement, build the wall, make sure we don't have sanctuary cities, and do what is necessary to defend this country. Ms. Trinnell, and a couple of terrorists were intercepted just in the last couple of weeks, like 12 terrorists coming across the southern border. I do, I do think that we do need um, immigra immigration reform. The last time we had any significant immigration reform was in 1986. So we definitely need to look at this and have reasonable people working together to address what these issues are. We can't be going with these yo-yo issues of executive orders. It's just not working. Congress has to come together and make reasonable immigration policies that everybody knows what the rules are. We cannot have these just absolute... Um, uh, you know, theater, theatrics, like Governor DeSantis did by flying people to New York, um, a state that he is now saying he needs their help. So we, we can't use people as pawns in this game. We have to talk about real reform so that we're being the, the democracy that we really are. Thank you. All right, we uh, actually just need, we have time for one more question. So I'm gonna start with you, Mr. Zinke. Yes. Would you support raising the age to buy semi-automatic weapons from 18 to 21, and are there any other gun controlled measures that you feel should be implemented? Uh, no, I would not support raising it 18 to 21. Um, a man or woman who joins the service and defends our country, I, deserve, I think deserves the right to have a weapon uh, and buy one. And it's not, the violence we see is, is not caused by weapons. A lot of it is caused by the breakdown of families, societal norms have changed, we have woke movements, we have a lot of pressure on, on units, you know, our society. But I don't think limiting guns, especially with Montana, our legacy is, is guns. Uh, we love guns. Uh, I own guns. I think, I think all my friends own guns. Uh, guns that are sa safely put away, so guns that are, are responsible, 
And if you're a gun owner, you should be responsible in, in use of them. You should understand how to use them and when to use them. So, no, I, I do not believe in restricting guns any more than they are. All right. Mr. Nell? So thank you, Jill, for the question. And I will say that on the trail traveling through this district, I have asked a lot of people in this district, conservative um, elected officials, how do you feel about keeping our communities safe? What are some of the right ways to come at this issue? I grew up on a ranch in eastern Montana. I understand the gun culture um, that we have here. And there are 27 amendments to our Constitution. I support them all. What I have been told by many of the conservative people in this district, that they would support extended background checks as a way to keep our community safe. I believe in representative democracy. I will represent the people of Western Montana on this issue. And we have to be on time now so that you can do your closing statement. So I'm going to go ahead, and if you don't mind, you had 30 seconds rebuttal then, but I'd like for us to please stay on time. God bless America, and God bless the Second Amendment. Well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, and I believe the closing statement to you first, with the extra seconds, we'll, we'll start there. Thank you. Well, it's, it's interesting, because Monica and I, I can't think of two candidates that are further apart. Um, Monica is absolutely lockstep, you heard it, with, with Nancy Pelosi's radical agenda. And let me give you a few examples. She wants to raise taxes on Montanans that make $200,000 or less. She wants to raise insurance rates for private insurance holders that are health care. She wants $133 trillion of new spending. While she says, yes, I support the police, she's also the lead legal counsel for 350 Montana that wants to die, defund police, and I quote, divest the significant part of their budget. That's defund. In our schools, she follows the Nancy Pelosi woke agenda to a T in that she wants boys playing girls sports, that she supports a clinic that, that, that ab uh, openly advocates for gender transition therapy and puberty blocking. Schools should be teaching math, science, basic curriculum, and parents should have a say in our school. And last, the investigations, if you look at them close and actually read them. I went through 18, and yes, Sox was one of them. And yes, I was not in interviewed in the, in the Whitefish property, which is a free children's sledding park. And no, I don't live in California, but my wife owns property in California. I do not. And to pick on my wife, my wife deserves every, every bit of respect, and my wife also has a right to work. So I am from Montana. I live in Montana. I'm going to die in Montana, so don't ever tell me that I'm, a, I'm not a Montana. And Monica... I don't know where you travel for, from around Montana and who you talk to, but the folks I'm talking to have a much different idea of the, of the hardships they're facing. Okay, Ms. Thank Tunnell. you. God okay. bless America. Thank you. Thank you so much for hosting this debate. I look forward to having John Lamb on the next one. Um, I grew up in eastern Montana as the sixth of ten children. I rode in the middle of our Olympic 8. I know the value and the power of the middle. And having been left behind on family trips, I know how easy it can be to overlook the middle. This is a moment when we need to come together. Our communities need to connect and re, um, recommit to restoring the middle class. And we can do that. I, the Montana that I grew up in, that I love, that I know, we take the problems that we face and we solve them together. And I, I am uniquely suited to meet this moment. This is my home. I have spent my entire professional career here working for you, with you, by your side, in the trenches. I have put almost 40,000 miles on my minivan traveling through this district, talking to you, getting to know you. In the Montana I grew up in, nobody talked about parties. We didn't mention it. We talked about each other. We talked about the basketball game. I played Class C basketball. I know how important it is to be accountable to each other. I want to work for you, Montana, and I'm asking you for your vote. I'm asking you to vote the way we did in the Montana I grew up in, where we voted for people, not parties. This is a moment that we can meet, and we have to meet it together. I'm for you. I'm for Montana. I am doing this to serve my home, the place I love, the place where you will find me every day, picking up my kids from school. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Montana, and I look forward to November 8th and having your vote with me so you can have a representative you're proud of in Congress. Thank you.
both of you, thank you so much deeply for, for coming and sharing your views with your voters. I think you made your points, and we tried to get to, to some, some tough questions and tough answers. And now it's up to the voters, and we look forward to following you both on the campaign trail and election night and to see how the voters decide. And and thank I'd you. Love I think you were very fair, and it was delightful. Thank, thank you. you and I'd, I'd love to see the poll that you have that you use to meet your criteria for tonight. That was all so. sent to the campaigns, and you had that months ago, and I have them right here, and they're posted on our website. If anybody wants to see that, it's on our website. And Monica, no, so Heather thank was you for not watching. The, well, not we'll see you website, soon. So. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ryan.